Welcome to another lecture by Medico Medics, learning made easy. Cholera. In this lecture, we will begin with a general introduction of Vibrio cholera. We will talk normal physiology, pathophysiology, and then compare the two. We will follow with a case example, discuss symptoms, diagnoses, and treatment, and as always, end with a summary. Now, cholera is an acute diarrheal disease caused by infection with the bacteria Vibrio cholera, primarily the serogroups O1 and O139. These produce a toxin that leads to severe dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Now, serogroups refer to distinct groups of Vibrio cholera classified by differences in their surface antigens. And O1 and O139 are the only ones known to cause large cholera outbreaks. So these bacteria then release a toxin that acts like a switch, turning the body's fluid losses to high, and this results in an extreme dehydration. Now, cholera is prevalent in regions with poor sanitation and limited access to clean water or where water is scarce, especially in parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And the transmission, so it's spread through ingestion of contaminated water or food. So the risk factors then include poor sanitation, crowded conditions, and or low stomach acidity. People with a reduced stomach acid, perhaps due to the use of medications or illness, are more susceptible because the acid normally present in your gut or in your stomach normally kills a lot of bacteria. Now, before we dive into the pathophysiology of cholera, let us just briefly review normal physiology of water and electrolyte absorption in the gut, specifically water absorption in the small intestine. Now, there are three important parts when you're talking about the normal physiology of water and electrolyte absorption. One of them is the cells lining the intestine normally absorb water and electrolytes like sodium and potassium from food and drink into our bloodstream. Furthermore, sodium and chloride ions are absorbed into our cells through specific channels, and water then follows these ions again into the bloodstream. Now, there are a lot of important channels and transporters involved in sodium and chloride absorption when we're talking about the small intestine. I would, however, recommend at least knowing two or three of them. So SGLT1 also stands for sodium glucose co-transporter 1. Now, it actively is it's actively involved in transporting sodium along with glucose from the intestinal lumen into enterocytes. ENAC, for example, stands for epithelial sodium channel. It facilitates sodium absorption, especially in the distal colon. And uh, NHE3 stands for sodium proton exchanger. So it exchanges luminal sodium for intracellular protons, which aids in sodium absorption. Finally, then, the intestine carefully balances absorbing water and releasing mucus to keep digestion smooth and protect the lining. Now, why is, uh, why is it important to understand or have an understanding of the normal physiology? Well, it is key to understanding cholera because the disease itself disrupts the gut's balance of water and electrolyte absorption. 
So in cholera, the cholera toxin, which we will talk about in greater detail, reverses the normal process by triggering excessive chloride and sodium secretion. And this goes into our intestinal lumen. And because water follows it, as we mentioned here, water follows these ions normally into the bloodstream. Now, for whatever reason, we're talking about the reverse. But the same happens. So sodium or chloride leaves our cells, water then follows. So this is what then leads to the massive watery diarrhea that characterizes cholera. And in the coming slides, we are going to dive into greater detail of the pathophysiology of it. Now, let's take a look at the pathophysiology of cholera. So cholera begins when the Vibrio cholera bacteria enters the body through contaminated food or water. It then attaches to the intestinal wall. So the bacteria travels to the small intestine where they attach to the walls, however, without invading the cells themselves. Rather, what they do is they release the cholera toxin. And it is the toxin that is the main cause of the severe diarrhea and fluid loss that then follows. So how does it do that? What is the action of the cholera toxin on our cells? Well, the toxin has two parts to it. One part binds to the cell receptors. The other enters the cells to cause harm. The toxin increases the levels of a molecule called cyclic AMP, often abbreviated CAMP. And this cyclic AMP opens chloride channels in the cell. So if we have a high level of cyclic AMP or cyclic AMP, it will cause chloride ions to flow out of the cell into our intestine. And where chlor is leaving, we have water following. And this is what creates large volumes of watery diarrhea. And the result of this is fluid and electrolyte loss. Now in the next slide, we will take a illustration and get into a bit more detail. Just so that you have a clear understanding of what is happening. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the pathophysiology of cholera using this illustration here for our examples. So as we have mentioned, we have the bacteria, Vibrio cholera, attaching itself to our intestinal wall. It then releases the actual toxin, the cholera toxin. Now the cholera toxin is made of the subunits or composed of subunits CTXA and B. Now CTB here, this subunit binds to GM1 ganglioside receptors, GM1, and it binds to them on the epithelial cells of the small intestine. Then the toxin, seen here in green, is endocytosed. And when it's been endocytosed, it is then transported to the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. Now inside the cell, the CTA subunit is released and it activates ADP uh, ribosylation factor 6. So ARF6 here. When this has been activated, the ARF6 uh, factor activates the G protein coupled receptor pathway, as indicated here. Now, when the G protein coupled receptor pathway has been activated, this then leads to what is super important it leads to the persistent activation of adenylate cyclase, seen here. And this increases cyclic AMP levels. 
So we arrive now at what we began to talk about in our, new, uh, in our normal physiology and the development of pathophysiology in our previous slides. So with the elevated cyclic AMP, we now will see an activation of protein kinase A seen here. So this arrow points here. Now, what does protein kinase A do here? Well, PKA or PKA phosphorylates and opens the CFTR chloride channels. And they are the cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptors. Now, once these receptors indicated here, or regulators, when these have been phosphorylated and opened, chloride ions are then secreted into the intestinal lumen via this CFTR. And due to uh, osmotic pressures and movement, sodium and water follow these chloride ions. So this will result in massive water loss from the body, leading to the classic um, watery diarrhea, which is a hallmark of cholera. So in summary then, again, the bacteria enters our body. It releases its toxin. That toxin then binds with receptors, gets endocytosed, goes to our endoplasmic reticulum. It then activates different factors. Those activate other receptors, like the G uh, protein coupled receptor. All in all, all of this leads to a crucial point where we have an elevated activity of our cyclic AMP. This then activates the protein kinase A, which opens and activates our cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptors. This is when chloride is able to then run out. But why does all that fluid follow? Because of osmotic changes. We will have sodium and water following this chloride. And with all that massive output and efflux, we will then see the classical sign of diarrhea. We will now erase the drawings, so feel free to study this image. Now then, let's just briefly look at normal versus pathological findings in cholera. So if it's a normal gut function, water and electrolytes should be normally absorbed we should see a balanced electrolyte level, and we should have normal stool consistency. If we compare that with a cholera-affected gut, we will have excessive water and electrolytes secreted into the gut. We should see uh, severe electrolyte loss, leading to cramps and weakness, and we should observe rice water stools due to large volumes of watery diarrhea and its cloudy appearance. Now let's take a look at a case example. We have Eric. He's a 35-year-old male. He's complaining of a sudden onset of watery diarrhea, vomiting, and muscle cramps. Recently, he traveled to a region with poor sanitation and drank untreated water. We do our physical exam and... Checking his vital signs, we observe a low blood pressure and high heart rate, suggesting dehydration. Furthermore, skin and eyes, so we see dry, tented skin, meaning a delayed return to normal when we pinch it, and sunken eyes, a classic sign of dehydration. Furthermore, we find thirst, dry mouth, and a decreased urine, uh, urine output, Again, all suggesting dehydration. The patient feels extremely thirsty and produces very little urine. These are all clear signs that his body is low on water. 
So in this example, we do check most of the symptomatology and risk factors involved in cholera. So just to repeat, symptoms, acute watery diarrhea, large volumes of watery diarrhea often described as rice water stools. And I would point out that this is quite high yield, especially for med students who are undergoing exams. And this is due to its pale, cloudy appearance. We will observe severe dehydration. A rapid fluid loss will lead to dehydration with symptoms like thirst, dry mouth, low urine output, and sunken eyes. And of course, electrolyte imbalance. So loss of salts and minerals like sodium and potassium will lead to muscle cramps, weakness, and in severe cases, even shock. So now then, let's work up our diagnosis. So we will be presented most likely with the classic rice water diarrhea and, of course, observable signs of dehydration. These are all very key indicators of cholera. We do labs to confirm, so we can do a stool culture to confirm the presence of the bacteria Vibrio cholera. There may also be rapid diagnostic tests available in some regions, again, to detect the antigen for Vibrio cholera in stool samples blood lab so checking for electrolyte levels sodium potassium chloride all to assess the extent of electrolyte loss also do consider assessing kidney health because severe dehydration does strain the kidneys so test to make sure that these are functioning properly then we move on to treating cholera so rehydration therapy, that's the main one you need to remember. So there are oral rehydration solutions. It's a solution of water, salts, and sugars designed to replace lost fluids and electrolytes. This to prevent severe dehydration. And of course, intravenous fluids. So for patients with severe dehydration who cannot drink enough oral rehydration solution, IV fluids will provide faster rehydration. Then we have antibiotic therapy, so doxycycline or uh, azithromycin. These antibiotics will shorten the duration of the diarrhea and reduce the amount of bacteria that is shed in stool. We can also add zinc supplementation because it helps reduce the severity and duration of diarrhea, especially in children. Zinc acts like a gut protector to help the intestine uh, recover faster from diarrhea. Again, especially in young children. Now, a important note, if it wasn't clear already. Antibiotics are secondary to rehydration. Because rehydration is the main life-saving intervention in cholera. So even though antibiotics will and could help, rehydration is the most crucial part of cholera treatment. So in summary then, Vibrio cholera is a severe diarrheal disease caused by Vibrio cholera bacteria, leading to rapid dehydration and electrolyte loss. Normally the intestine absorbs water, but in cholera, toxins force the cells to release too much fluid leading to diarrhea. And I would say it's quite high yield to know how that happens. So do make sure to go back and repeat the pathophysiology. With the overactivation of cyclic AMP, we had the opening of chloride efflux from the cell, and water then follows. Diagnosis, so based on the distinct watery diarrhea, dehydration signs, and confirmed by stool culture, we have our diagnosis. We then move immediately to treatment. And the treatment focuses on rehydration. And we, of course, if we have it available, we use antibiotics to reduce transmission and symptoms. However, again, priority is rehydration. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening. If you liked our video, please like and subscribe for more videos.